Hello and welcome to the Talking Vertical Climbing Podcast with your host Liam Kilsby Steele. How are you doing today? So today we are going to be looking at the past and the history of where climbing began and where it's going to. We're going to go all the way back, looking back at some brief past of where it first started in the 1800s, whistling our way through where bouldering developed, how indoor climbing developed, whistling through big wall climbing and then looking towards the Olympics and where outdoor climbing might be going next. I hope you guys enjoy today's podcast. So there's three main places that are credited to being the birthplace of modern climbing, and that's the Peak District and the Lake District in England, the sandstone region of southeastern Germany called LB, and the Dolomite. By the first decade of the 20th century, pioneers were experimenting with all sorts of things in these areas, from steel carabiners to steel iron rung pitons. The piton is a very key part of the climbing history. Now, back in the start of the 20th century, there was two styles of climbing. There's something today that we're going to call three climbing, and there was something that was called a climbing. Now, free climbing should not be got confused with the idea of free soloing which many of us have come to terms with um, of Alex Honnold doing where he climbs with no rope um, up the ascent of El Capitan. Three climbing actually means that it's simply reaching the top of a cliff by only using your strength so your arm is your physical ability. You do use a safety system as a rope or bouldering pad but they are only there to aid you as you fall. They don't help you get up. Whereas aid climbing the other reason means that a climber uses all sorts of ways to get up the cliff. They don't just use their uh, physical strength. They can use gear. They can pull on things. They can use lots of different things. And actually in the early days, this was more how climbing was done. Now, there is so much debate, especially in America, about whether age climbing is true climbing and whether using these pitons which is where you put this iron rod in the rock is actually should be allowed to be used to be a real climber um, a German climber Paul Prusus produced an essay in the German Alpine uh, journal in 1911 uh, stating that the piton is an emergency aid and not a basis of system for mountaineering very interesting. That's where that whole debate started. Now, throughout the 20th century, techniques, knowledge have all developed in all these early hotspots in North America, Europe and elsewhere. And the early era accumulated, what we're going to call the early era of climate. It finished in the 1930s when many of the first climbs in Europe and North America were sort of completed, technical climbs completed. Just some of you guys, if you want to know what some of them call such a first descent of the Ship Rock in New Mexico or the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, all the way to the Walker Spur of the Grand Juras in the French Alps. We're going to leave this, this uh, the higher cliffs climbing just for a second, just to kind of understand and look at a bit of the history of bouldering. Now, whilst a lot of rock climbing draws the biggest and most attention are those taller cliffs, a lot of climbers actually look for this smaller, bolder style of climb. And it, a lot of people like this because it focuses and masters their mind and really shows them their athletic potential and only on a really small scale. Now, bouldering is described as climbing without a rope on a small cliff or boulder where it's possible to land relatively safely. Uh, a lot of boulderers today will use a pad, but if you go back in time and look, a lot of boulderers didn't use pads to start with. I'm definitely not sure I could do that. Now, bouldering first developed in the boulders of Fontainebleau outside of Paris in the mid of the century. Because bouldering really took off is because it allowed climbers to practice those hard moves, those really intricate moves without having a rope or without having safety worries so they could really test their abilities and push through these moves to then be able to use it in their free climbing styles in the alps so many of the mountaineers would come down test and push themselves on these smaller boulders 
and then develop that all through the time. Now, this is where chalk first came from. It kind of developed in the 1950s and 60s by a man called John Gill. Um, this may be disputed, but he was one of the first people to actually start to put a systematic exercise and training to bouldering. And part of that was using magnesium carbide chalk, which a lot of gymnasts have known to use to stop his hands from sweating, which I am sure many of you know, if you don't know, climbers love chalk. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll let you work that out. Now, that's bouldering, but we're going to go from riddle, little biddle boulders all the way up to big wall climbing now. Now, big wall climbing is the big tall stuff. Um, again, that's what Alex Honnold did on Free Solo. Um, a lot of this is known in big wall climbing in the Yosemite Valley in California. And it really became the testing ground for climbers in the post-World War II era. It started off in the late 1940s with a Swiss immigrant called John Slavier, and when he began experimenting with a new breed of pitons made extremely of hard extreme steel, what that allowed him to do was put these in the very thin cracks of the Yosemite rock. And then they were able to basically work without buckling. This new design, along with other inventions, including uh, mechanical ascenders, specialised hammocks could be anchored to the cliff face, sparked that golden age of climbing in which many of the first iconic cliffs in Yosemite, such as Half Dome and Al Capitan, were first extended. There was a there was a change, there was a revolution in climbing. For the first 70 years, climbing used the piton, technical climbing, and these spikes were metal spikes driven into those cracks, giving you that protection. And it was their primary form of protection. Now, in 1972, an edition of the Chardonnay Equipment Catalogue, Yvonne Ch Chinoaud and Tom Frost and Doug Robinson argued that actually doing this repetitive hammering of pitons into established climbing routes was destroying the landscape and the resources that we had. Every time you hammered a new one in, every time you climbed the cliff, you can imagine what that was doing for the rock. They actually advocated that people use less invasive protection, both for free climbing and aid climbing, um, namely things like nuts, hetrix, um, which are like machined aluminium shapes that could be slotted into these cracks. So in theory, something that you can take out of the rock without having to hammer it in and put it in. A lot of people during this time were starting to see aid climbing as the only real way to do it in free climbing. And there was, but this didn't allow people to really go and test themselves on the rock. Up until the 1970s, a lot of free climbers felt that it was cheating to hang on a rope and try and move over and over again. Such like someone would do in bouldering, like you meant to just climb it up and one. But sports climbing was about to change this. The 1970s was a very influential influen, influential decade and um, where free climbers began to experiment, experiment, experiment with something that we're going to call hang dodging. This is basically going on a climb and rehearsing the sequence of difficult moves over and over again while resting on the rope between moves and an attempt to really master the climb. In the late 1970s, climbers near France, Verdun Gorge, a spectacular feature sometimes compared to the Grand Canyon in Europe, began to rappel down from the top on otherwise unscalable cliffs and use this and put equipment in to really stick permanent bolts in the rock and then attempt to free climb them from the bottom. In the early 1980s in Smith Rocks, Oregon, a local climbing aide, Alan Watts, began developing using similar top-down tactics. So, basically, people were looking to rappel down from the top of the rock, bolt it in, and then use that to climbing. Hang dodging and these bolting equipment climbs were combined together to create what we know today as sports climbing. Climbing for a physical challenge on a route using the engineered protection that had already been put in, opening up so many more routes to you. Now, in 
This, in contrast to what we, many of us, won't know or might know as trad climbing, trad climbing is more where you just put the protection in yourself. Okay, so this is a big change of what's going on. Now, during this whole time, there was a sort of craze for people to climb on artificial rocks. And we're going to take a step back from 1980s, back into 19. 19- 39 in fact is where the first records for of people climbing on architectural structures and we're going to go back to england now where a lot of us have been talking about america now it's noting that people actually were climbing the facades of universities notably the university of leeds and the university of washington where there was a lot of stone walls on the campus and people began to gather to spot the climbers climbing it this led to probably the first indoor purpose wheel bouldering walls being introduced in the 1980s, which massively spread throughout North America and Europe. These actual first generations of gyms were often um, a pretty rough and ready experience with homemade walls and holds, um, dusty and filled with coloured tapes to determine actually where the route went so you didn't go by the color of the hold which some centers most do now you had a little bit of different colored tape a lot of these walls as many of us know have now become a lot more in this bouldering and climbing wall has become a real commercial venture with a specific wall manufacturer specific hold, professional route setters and more and we're even seeing that pushing even more with these commercials really pushing themselves now with including things like air filters air conditioning and so forth now we're getting near to the end of the climbing journey as you can see we're moving into the 21st century we're going to take a little bit of a step into the competition climbing realm now as many of you may know climbing has now actually been included in the 2020 olympics which i'm suspecting will now be in the 2021 now climbing as a competition has always been growing and has become a very legitimate organized sport in itself early events such as the 1988 international sports climbing competition which was held on a 110 foot outdoor wall in Utah, helped pave the way for the climbing competitions that we have today such as the world cup series and eventually what we're seeing now is the inclusion of climbing in the 2020 olympics now for the 2020 olympics for those of you guys who don't know climbing will be in a three disciplines format which will be bouldering lead sport climbing and speed climbing all for one medal this is an interesting take i'm not going to drop into that now we'll have another podcast on this but it is worth noting that in the paris 2024 olympics we are going to see these disciplines split up again which i believe is going to lead and bouldering and then a separate medal for speed now the big developments in climbing haven't just been at jumping into the olympics big wall climbing is becoming a big surge and a big interesting freight for people to really push themselves and bring all of these multi disciplines that we've explored through this podcast today into one climbing now a lot of people may know tommy caldwell as a big key big wall climber himself and some german brothers named alex and thomas huber were a lot of the pioneers in the second age of the yosemite valley um uprising what a great film again and what the key part of big wall climbing is that you apply your fitness your tactic gained from elite sport climbing and climbing the traditional aid routes in el capitan and bringing this all together to free climb some really cool big wall routes where each time we're pushing for bigger and better routes a lot of big wall climbers will stay up on the wall with their gear for weeks and weeks on end and it's really interesting that they're able to pull the skills that they've learned from bouldering from all of this new indoor styles of rock climbings to this granite big wall climbing tommy caldwell observed that a lot of new school indoor climbing which includes these big dynamic moves actually translates pretty well to the big granite walls where the cruxes tend to be short stretches between holes and crack sequence so what you have is yourself climbing up with this crack and then you need to get from one crack to the next and you really have to work out how to do that now 
to round off this podcast, we just want to note that climbing is becoming a massively huge sport. It's growing and growing. And I've taken you through the journey of the history, bringing us right back from those ancient cave systems all the way through to the Olympics and where big wall climbing may be going. Now, there's a lot of commercial gyms opening up every month throughout the world massively in Europe and it's becoming a very mainstream mainstream sport now this recent growth is creating some form of pressure in terms of land access because there's a lot of people wanting to go on those rocks that people have been climbing for ages now a key part of the future of climbing which we're going to be discussing in another podcast is really looking to expand into new areas of the world where there's lots of fresh rock now I'm just going to leave you with this quote from a National Geographic explorer, Mike Liebecki. He says, you can't just go out and explore another Mount Everest, but some of the greatest bouldering fields and outdoor climbing sport crags and big walls are still out there to be found. The mystery equals the adventure. Go out there, guys. Enjoy the climbing. Have fun. My name's Liam Kirsby Steele. I've been your host today. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into the history of climbing and let me know any of your questions. See you in the next one. Talking Vertical is a climbing podcast brought to you by OKS Climbing.